Well, welcome everyone. We just wanted to kick off this with a little bit of a stage setting for our communities conservation and livelihoods discussion. But first, um, my name is Kristen Walker and I am the chair of the IUCN Commission on Environment, Economics and Social Policy. And we would like to give you a welcome, but we would like to introduce Raymond Sewell from the Mi'kmaq community um, to give us a, a, an opening for today's session that will help us ground us um, and reflect on the spirit, the work, our connection with nature. Um, so Raymond, um, I welcome you to, to open this session for us. Thank you. Hello everyone, it's a great day today here in uh, Mi'kmaq, I'm in Jabukto, Califax. Um, and I'm always thinking about at these openings acknowledging the land we're on. So here we're on the land of the Elnu, Skiji Elnu, people who walk on the earth. It's the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone for the great work we're doing. And uh, we have a thing for hospitality here in uh, Mi'kmaq. So I'd like to share a welcoming sort of opening song, a gathering song, uh, just to start the day with good vibes and uh, to thank everyone for their good work. So, Wanali aguano de Wanali aguano danae Te guano de Yali aguano de Te guano de Ali ayo yo e Yo, yo, e, ahi, ahi, ya, yo, yo, e. Di, do, di, jane. Di, do, i, jane. Wan, ali, ya, wan, no, de. Wanali aguano danae Oka e oka Oka e oka Wanali aguano de Wanali aguano danae Oh. And we'll just call the act. Don't forget from where your roots are. And I thank everyone uh, for coming today to the whole community and uh, put good energy into our work. So eloquent, good work. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Raymond. And I think um, the grounding that Raymond has given us today is very important in this week where we look at Earth Day or Earth Week. Um, we also have the convening of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. And last week with the IUCN, we actually the last two weeks, we celebrated the IUCN Youth Summit where we convened close to 15,000 uh, 15, youth from around the world. So we welcome you to this celebration and this discussion on um, communities, conservation and livelihood and the effectiveness. And I'm gonna pass it to my colleague and partner in this event, um, Tony Charles um, from uh, the Community Conservation Research Network based at uh, St. Mary's University in Halifax. Tony, I will pass it over to you to, to give your opening and the introduction to CCRN in the book as well. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kristen, and uh, thanks to everyone for joining today. It's much appreciated. Uh, like Raymond, I'm speaking to you from Mi'kmaq, uh, the traditional and unceded land of the Mi'kmaq or Lanu people on the east coast of Canada. As we lead up to Earth Day this week, and as the world deals with the tragedies of COVID-19, uh, I hope today's session highlights some bright lights in small places. Around the world, uh, in city neighborhoods and in rural villages, people are coming together in their communities to tackle some of the biggest challenges. Uh, and, and in our case, we're looking at solutions that sustain livelihoods and maintain or restore healthy local environments. The action these communities are taking and the solutions they are finding can inspire a way forward. As director of the Community Conservation Research Network, I'd like to start by 
as uh, Kristen uh, noted, giving a little bit of background about our network. The CCRN uh, focus is on local communities and how they work towards sustainable livelihoods through conservation and stewardship. Uh, the network engages with local communities, indigenous organizations, environmental groups, governments and resource user organizations in 30 locations around the world and on a global basis. While the focus is on the uh, community level, we also look at how that scales up to all levels. We look at how local communities protect their environment and sustain their local economy, but it's not just about communities. We also look at how governments engage with and support communities or how they don't. Uh, the CCRN's work has led over the years to two key messages that uh, are not new to us, but we found that they resonate uh, on a broad basis. First, environmental conservation and management must draw on the deep knowledge of local and indigenous communities. Second, empowering local communities and indigenous rights holders and actively engaging with them in respectful partnerships leads to improved conservation and management. Uh, drawing on these messages, the CCRN has developed an online resource kit on community conservation that we hope is useful on a worldwide basis. The site has guidebooks, videos, animations, webinars, and even a participatory world map that lets you add your own community and its conservation story. One highlight that was released last year on the learning site is a documentary, Sustainable Futures, Communities in Action. Well, all that's freely available, and that brings me to our subject today, another freely available resource, uh, this new book, Communities, Conservation and Livelihoods. It's an online book that focuses, uh, like the CCRN, on the role of local communities around the world in conserving their environment and sustaining their economies and livelihoods. The book was produced by CCRN and co-published, uh, as Kristen noted, our partner in a partnership that uh, I value very greatly with uh, CSP and IUCN. Uh, Communities, Conservation and Livelihoods is designed uh, to be accessible to a wide audience of local communities, non-governmental organizations, indigenous organizations, government policymakers, educational bodies, and others. The book highlights how environmental conservation and sustainable economies go hand in hand within local communities. It explores the wide variety of community conservation initiatives, the actions being taken and the solutions being found. I wanna give you just a brief idea of the book itself uh, in, in a minute or so. Uh, it, we have 10 core chapters in the book that look at community conservation uh, and the livelihood uh, connection uh, from various angles. For example, one chapter explores the ideas behind community conservation. Another looks at the social ecological systems view that underlies the book, recognizing that human society and nature are closely interrelated. Another chapter looks at the motivations for conservation in communities, while two more explore the biodiversity and the livelihood outcomes. <coughs> Then we turn to governance, decision-making, power, and indigenous realities within that overall picture of communities, conservation, and livelihoods. The book celebrates the efforts of local communities, thousands of them the world over, and the book itself covers a good number of those real-world communities in what we call community stories. The stories of local action and local solutions come from Canada, Mexico, Brazil, Bolivia, Iran, South Africa, India, Thailand, Indonesia, and Cambodia. Many of the stories feature indigenous communities and their challenges. I hope you'll have a chance to look at the book. Maybe you already have. It reflects the work of over 40 contributors, and we'd like to think it could be of use within individual communities around the world, but also by governments, NGOs, schools, universities, and other educational centers. It asks a fundamental question what makes conservation effective, and it answers through a community perspective. You'll hear a lot more about that today. I'll turn it back now to Kristen to introduce uh, today's speakers. Thanks, Kristen. Great, thank you, Tony, for that um, wonderful introduction. And we have also dropped the link to the book in the chat for the ten, the ten, our 411 attendees and growing. And I just wanna acknowledge that we have people coming in from around the world, from Canada, Colombia, Africa, Asia, 
and we thank you for all of your participation here today. Um, I want to turn to our panelists and I'll give an introduction of our panelists. We are happy to have um, Dr. Fikret Burks um, here today. Just many of you know him well, but he's a distinguished professor emeritus at the Natural Resource Institute at the University of Manitoba. Dr. Burke's work deals with social ecological resilience, commons, co-management, local and traditional ecological knowledge. Um, his 11 books include Advanced Introduction to Community-Based Conservation, which was just published in 2021, and Sacred Ecology in its fourth edition in 2018. We are also joined by Laura Lokes. Laura has 22 years of experience living, working, and raising a family in the Teluata territory in the heart of Klaikonat Sound on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And she joins us very early this morning. She has been practicing community-based marine and forest conservation for over 30 years on both the Atlantic and the Pacific coasts of Canada. In 2005, she received her PhD in resource management, resource and environmental management from SFU. We are pleased to have her here today, and we are hoping, um, depending on connectivity in his community, that we will have Onel Masardule from the Kuna community in Panama. <coughs> Onel uh, is the executive director of the Foundation for the Promotion of Indigenous Knowledge in Panama, which focuses on the recovery and strengthening of Indigenous knowledge on environment through a gender-inclusive approach. They focus on training and engagement at the local level with their Guna communities while advocating for indigenous rights at the international policy level. Um, Onel is a, both an advocate at the local level, but also at the international level and often participates in the CBD and UNFCCC processes. So Tony, I'm gonna pass it over to you to kick off some of our questions for our panelists and we welcome you all. Thanks very much, uh, Kristen. Um, and let me just uh, add uh, that um, everyone joining today is welcome to uh, post uh, questions in the Q and A uh, part of the uh, of, of the bottom part of your uh, screen, and um, and we'll be uh, having a Q and A session uh, following the the speakers. Um, I hope I said that right, Kristen. Um, and so, uh, so feel free to pose a question in the Q and A to uh, individuals, uh, and uh, that could include uh, Kristen and I, but also the uh, speakers that are coming up. Um, and we'll get to as many as we can. We're we're going to follow a little bit of a interactive approach rather than just uh, uh, turning it over to the speakers. I'm I'm going to pose a, a question, and I'm going to start uh, with um, with Fikret Burkus. Figured out a fundamental question to get us started. In your experience, and I know you have a, a lot of experience with local communities, what's a particular ingredient that makes conservation effective? Uh, hi, Tony. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning from uh, Winnipeg, Canada. Um, Tony's question is, of course, partially answered in the in the book that you have. Uh, there are many ingredients to successful conservation. Uh, they are discussed in uh, chapter 10. Uh, and also another chapter discusses the, uh, the meanings and motivations of conservation. Since I have limited time, I'm going to focus on one uh, particular aspect and that's of incentives. <clears throat> Uh, conservation to some of us is, a, is an ideal, but for many communities worried about their livelihoods, conservation is about livelihoods. So the, the big question for them is, is how, do I, uh, how do I get the benefits from what I conserve? That's, that's sort of basic commons theory. I'm referring to Eleanor Ostrom, uh, the, the Nobel laureate Ostrom, who says, to, to be able to manage or conserve any resource, you have to first be able to control outsiders from getting it while you're trying to conserve it. But also you have to be able to make your internal rules for the use of that resource. Um, so what, what are these, these factors and incentives? Um, well, they are economic, environmental, social, cultural, and political. Um, Economics is obviously very important, but uh, but not quite the uh, the kind of economics in the in the bad old days of conservation where 
some people thought you just you just bribe the communities and they let you do a conservation project. It just doesn't work like that. You can't bribe communities to conserve. What you can do is help them get better livelihoods. And that means uh, livelihood diversification. It means training. It means opening up markets. It means networking. So there are a lot of factors involved in, in economic incentives. Environmental incentives are are actually very important as well, because if you don't have a resource, then you don't have any economics, uh, economic benefits you can get from the resource. So it's, uh, it's often the environmental concern is often the driver of, of all the other uh, kinds of incentives. And uh, it's, it's, uh, in our experience, it's often the, uh, the, the overuse or the destruction of a resource that actually triggers a conservation action so you got to, conservation is not a uniform thing, but, but there are jumps, there are triggers in, in, in how it happens at the community level. Um, so in addition to those, those there are social, cultural, uh, social usually kicks in later in, in late developing conservation cases. Cultural is very important, especially for indigenous peoples and, and they're political. Okay, well, th <laughs> thank you, um, Secret. Um, that's, uh, I mean, that's an interesting focus on incentives. And, and I, I'd like you to maybe expand a bit on the, the, the point you mentioned about political incentives. Is that a key ingredient for success and, and why? Yes, and, and often it, it, it's, it's what enables everything else. And uh, this is the, the question of, of, of basically resource control. Uh, most communities, not just indigenous ones, they, they want to have a say, they want empowerment. They want to have a say in the decisions that are being made. And that's, that's really important ingredient of, of conservation. Uh, and, and secondly, although many, many groups really don't want to have anything to do with governments, uh, many others do. They want to work with government. So the, the political angle here is that, is that they want better relations because they know they can't manage resources just at the local level. It, it has to be uh, connected to other levels. It has to be connected to political environment. And the third and important one is, is control of resources and land. This, this comes up, especially with indigenous peoples and all the indigenous groups I know around the world are, are in a struggle and that includes uh, the Canadian indigenous groups, it includes uh, Australian, the Taiwanese, the Sami of Europe. Uh, I, I, I hope our speaker from the Kuna of Panama can join us because that's, that's one of the big examples of, of, of an indigenous group trying to control its land and resources. It's so important. So the, uh, the big message here is that, that, uh, that, that local communities, including indigenous peoples, they want empowerment, and that's that's what what that allows them. That's that the motivation that they need to engage in conservation. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. Thanks, Tony. Well, well, thank you, Fikret. I, I think there's maybe time for one quick question more, if I could, Fikret. Uh, and I, I want you to look to the future. Uh, it. it um, you know, when we when we look at community conservation, of course, the examples we have are, are either present or or past. What do you see coming up in the future? Uh, how will how will things change? I guess in society and uh, and how will that affect communities dealing with conservation and livelihoods? Well, uh, my my vision is that conservation is not something you do in in little areas where you kick people out. These are islands of conservation. Basic ecological theory will tell you that islands of conservation, no, no matter how well conserved, will lose biodiversity in time. So we, we have to move from that kind of mindset to one in which people are in, in, in people are living in the ecosystem. These are what we've been calling social ecological systems. They're living in the ecosystems, working with it, identifying with it, conserving it, and using it for their livelihoods. I think that's also the basic message of the book. Okay, well, thank you so much. And we will have time to explore more in the uh, question and answer period. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Fikret. I'd, I'd like to turn to uh, Laura Lokes now. And uh, uh, Laura, you are uh, you're in uh, a community uh, person, but you also have uh, have studied a great deal, and you have a a, a good part in the uh, in the book, as as does Fikret um, that we're uh, celebrating today. Uh, but from the community perspective, and uh, and in particular, um, your experience living and working at the community level on the west coast of Canada, promoting conservation, promoting livelihoods, what challenges do you have to overcome? Uh, and I guess if I can throw in there uh, another part to that, can you describe some examples of how communities have succeeded in overcoming the challenges and becoming uh, or being good stewards of the ecosystems in your region, Laura? Thanks, Tony, and hello, everyone. And I'm speaking this morning from the unceded territory of Tolokwit. And I think there are many challenges, but I'll focus on a key one since we don't have a lot of time. But a key challenge really is um, the struggle to change the rules. The struggle to change the rules that put more pressure on communities to resolve environmental challenges with fewer financial assets and resources, while outside business interests often have access to wealth, strong government support, and the power to exploit resources unsustainably. And this struggle can often last decades. So to maintain the momentum um, to, 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 to build that resistance to that downward force um, takes, Innovation, it takes partnerships, it takes um, uh, a strong motivation um, to protect these areas, these homes. And, and where I am um, living, the, the Nuchalneth culture is, is a key part of that strength and that attachment to this home. And um, an example of how communities have succeeded in doing this, in the early 1980s, the Tolokwit First Nation leadership stood together with local community leadership in Tofino to protect the old growth forest down Mears Island that was threatened to be logged by a large forestry company. And, and that forestry company had access to this area because of a new government policy for land use um, management. So the resistance of this policy change took the mobilization of um, not only these communities, but more and more partnerships. And it lasted for over 10 years until finally the Clockwood Science uh, Review Panel was struck. And it was, it was that new decision-making body that actually helped change the decision-making regime, that helped change the rules. And after, after that time, the forestry policy changed. Um, harvesting practices changed. There's no longer clear cutting in this area and we were designated a UNESCO biosphere region. So that's clearly an example of some success there. Uh, and, and you referred to that as dealing with downward forces and, and, and external challenges. Uh, and if I can follow up then, are there also internal forces that a community is dealing with when they're thinking about conservation and livelihoods, internal forces that may create challenges, but maybe also opportunities. Can you can you comment on on that yeah. possibility? I'll, I'll try to explain. Um, the internal forces really come to to the internal control mechanisms of a community, which are largely driven by community values and, and the cultural foundation that generates and holds those values. In this part of the world, the Nichalnas really, I mean, over, over 10,000 years of forming cultural ties with this landscape and the values that emerge from um, these relationships between people and place have really been the underpinning that allowed the, the scientific panel to, to adopt the new challenge principle of Hishtakish Sawak, everything is connected as one. That We are still living into that principle as a community. The challenge is that non-Indigenous people don't necessarily um, understand um, that there is no separation between people and place. And so um, while that principle has offered enormous opportunity for us to bridge um, cultures and build partnerships, 
Um, we've got uh, community forest partnerships between um, First Nations and, and non-First Nations communities. But, but part of the challenge is that um, our Western worldview is still very much a colonized worldview and in, in our, in our institutions and our structures are very much based on separation. Whereas the Nichalith worldview is, is all about non-separation. And um, colonization continues to be um, something that we struggle with in this community and reconciliation is a process we're all engaged in. Well, thank you. Uh Laura, I'm going to ask one more question, and um, like uh, like the media sometimes say, we just have a minute or so uh, to to uh, answer this. So, what about climate change? There, there's a small, quick uh, item: uh, climate glo a global force like climate change. What what do you see in your region? Uh, communities being able to do, uh, whether it's in mitigation or or in adaptation. Uh, that's a great question. I think because of the foundation I already described that this community was able to resist clear cutting logging and the fact that we are one of the few areas in British Columbia that have maintained uh, highly productive old growth forest stands. We have a unique opportunity um, in the face of climate change to really um, uh, show how valuable this forest is in carbon sequestration. Um, we have an opportunity to work together in our marine environment to really protect um, um, eelgrass beds, seagrass beds. And really, I think the opportunity here is we need to work together. We cannot do this alone. So climate change in the face of, of, of the internal mechanisms we have and the organizations that we've, we've built and, and the reconciliation process that's underway. Um, if we can shift our Western worldview to one that's more about everything is connected as one, I think climate change could be a galvanizing force for a positive future. Well, thank you so much. And, uh... I, um, I'm going to turn it back to Kristen now to uh, uh, talk with and pose some questions to Onel. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And I think um, our Q&A is generating quite a bit of conversation here. Onel, we have you here. Do you hear me in Spanish? Sí, te escucho y te estoy viendo. Los veo a todos. Okay, great. Well, thank you for joining us, um, Ona. We know that you are in your community and we know you've had a few challenges to connect to the internet. Um, but we would love to hear from you about the challenges and experience that the Kuna community are having today and how you are organized to sort of respond and support your culture, but engage and deal with um, sort of the Panamanian government in responding to your needs and managing your resources. Okay, no eran bien mi guayarat pa, buenas can, amaré mi mi cigarrito silpa. Buenos días, hermanos y hermanas, eh, por la oportunidad que tenemos hoy de intercambiar ideas sobre algo importante que es nuestros recursos naturales, nuestro medio ambiente. Bueno, yo espero no tener problemas con la señal, que la señal a veces acá se cae y se y se viene. Bueno, el pueblo cuna rápidamente, para ponerlo en el contexto, eh, tiene una particularidad. En Panamá somos siete pueblos indígenas. De los siete pueblos indígenas, eh, todos los pueblos indígenas, felizmente tenemos territorio reconocido por ley, por el Estado. Y la, el pueblo cuna dentro de Panamá tiene cuatro territorios, que son Cunayala, Madungandí, Wargandí, y Dakar Cuñala. La población mayoría de la comarca Cunayala, donde yo soy parte de allí. Está la particularidad que la única, el único pueblo en Panamá que tiene su autonomía es la, el cuna de, la, de Cunayala, no así los cunas de, otras, de otro territorio. Nosotros tenemos nuestro propio gobierno, ¿ya? que es el, el, los gobiernos indígenas, Tenemos tres Fs, o sea que le decimos a Ayla Dumangan en nuestro idioma. Esto no ha permitido tener una 
eh, una política interna, una norma interna de gestionar los recursos naturales. ¿ya? Esto ya es propio del pueblo cuna. El pueblo cuna eh, tiene sus normas, tiene ordenado el ordenamiento territorial, en qué lugar se puede trabajar en el campo y en qué lugar se tiene que dejar los sitios sagrados, la, los hábitats importantes para la biodiversidad. Porque en la filosofía de como pueblos indígenas, estoy seguro, nosotros tenemos de que no somos dueños de la naturaleza. La naturaleza es dueña de nosotros. Somos solamente un componente más de la naturaleza. Y por lo tanto, no quiere decir que nosotros dominamos a la naturaleza. Ellas son las que nos dominan. Por eso no estamos viendo el problema del cambio climático, las inundaciones que ocurren, las lluvias torrenciales. Es porque la naturaleza no tiene dominio entre en nosotros. Cuando otros sistemas piensan que somos los jefes y amos de la naturaleza. ¿ya? Por eso hay una eh, explotación desmedida en muchos recursos. Entonces, como yo le dije, indica, indiqué, hay sitios sagrados que ningún cuna puede violar, tiene que dejarlo para conservar. Es, es una relación espiritual con la naturaleza. Hay sitios donde se tiene que conservar porque es un hábitat importante para una especie de la fauna o de la flora. Y hay otros lugares que nosotros utilizamos de manera eh, sostenible porque el cuna practica la agricultura rotacional que significa que después de usar 5 o 6 años, lo dejan a recuperar los nutrientes por 25, 30, 40 años para luego volver. Como verán que no es una agricultura extensiva ni intensiva, sino que se sabe manejar. Este, este es el modelo que tenemos nosotros, son normas internas que, que todos cuna tenemos que, eh, que cumplir. De igual manera, en, la, en el sistema de producción tiene que ser una, ahora que llaman agroforestería. Eso ya el CUNA lo ha practicado y como otros pueblos indígenas, los más seguros lo ha practicado desde hace mil años. ¿ya? ¿Ya? Ahora actualmente estamos, ya estoy trabajando en mi finca, tengo que tener árboles frutales, tengo que tener eh, todo tipo de, 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 de productos. ¿ya? No solamente pensar como lo hace en el sistema occidental, que solamente si es árboles de teca, se llena de teca para poder, si es palma aceitera se llena de palma aceitera porque es una visión económica cuando el pueblo indígena no tiene esa visión económica, sino de una visión de, de uso sostenible realmente, aprovechar de la naturaleza lo que nos quiere y, y además también hay una práctica de intercambio de semillas, acá nosotros intercambiamos semillas, los pueblos no venden semillas, si yo no tengo semillas de caña de azúcar y el otro tiene semillas de maíz, lo intercambiamos para ir produciendo. Es una manera de la sostenibilidad de los recursos. De igual manera, eh, los recursos minerales es una, eh, algo sagrado. Para el pueblo cuna es, si uno pre, explota los recursos naturales, en los mineros es como sacar sangre a la madre tierra. Y por tanto no se permite en nuestro territorio ni lo, la explotación minera, ni la ganadería, ¿ya? porque tiene que ser algo natural. Entonces yo creo que esto permite a nosotros, no ha permitido que nuestro territorio se mantenga como lo hemos mantenido, que tenga una alta biodiversidad. ¿ya? No, es, eh, no es mentira que cuando uno sobrevuela, Cristina ha estado en mi territorio, sabe cuando sobrevolamos en la cordillera del territorio cuna, hay un contraste con la parte occidental y la parte indígena, verá la área verde en el área indígena, mientras las áreas que son controladas por los no indígenas, verá que hay una deforestación enorme. Entonces yo creo que estas son las normas internas que nos permite eh, y lo otro punto importante, la, nosotros mantenemos que la, si uno tiene una fortaleza de sus instituciones indígenas, ¿ya? vamos a poder manejar la situación de manejar nuestro recurso natural. Porque en muchos casos, los estados lo que hacen, debilitan los los sistemas de gobernanza tradicional para poder imponer su sistema. Es una cuestión que es un, eh, contradice cuando dicen que quieren conservar. De igual manera, en Cunayala tenemos un área protegida, pero esa es un área protegida no, eh, declarado por los propios pueblos indígenas y gobernado por los propios indígenas. Pero eso también nos lleva a una eh, discrepancia con el Estado porque el Estado tiene la área protegida bajo el marco del Sistema Nacional de Área Protegida. 
donde tiene sus normas y todo eh, lo que tiene que ver. Y cuando el Estado necesita esa área protegida para infraestructura, cambia las leyes. ¿ya? Mientras ese pueblo cuna no, lo mantiene y todavía... Es. Entonces, ¿qué pasa? Que esto el Estado no apoya como debe ser esa, esa práctica. Ahora no lo ha apoyado de esa práctica. Porque prefieren tener bajo su dominio que tenga bajo su, el dominio de los pueblos indígenas. Además de esto, sabemos que las, los territorios indígenas son áreas de conservación, ¿ya? independientemente de que si declara o no declara, porque lo mantenemos. ¿ya? Yo creo que si hacemos una, un diagnóstico, un inventario de todos los territorios indígenas, veremos en la gran mayoría hay alta biodiversidad, ¿ya? hay alta eh, práctica de conservar los recursos naturales. Pues son estos son situaciones que hay. Ahora bien, la relación con el Estado, no, no necesariamente las políticas nacionales conlleva con la visión indígena, porque las políticas nacionales en muchos casos está con una visión economicista, porque lo pone en precio a todo lo que es la naturaleza. Entonces muchas veces también incide ya en otro pueblo. En el caso de Cunayala, por tener una, una, re, una gobernanza propia, impide que realmente eh, afecte, impacte de manera, eh, de manera fuerte en, eh, estas leyes que los estados, el Estado panameño aprueba, porque tenemos nuestra gobernanza. Pero eso no quiere decir que no, tenemos, no estamos bajo la presión, ¿ya? Tenemos una presión enorme, ¿ya? Eh, hubo un intento del Estado panameño de crear una base naval dentro del territorio, la cual fue rechazado por el pueblo cuna porque la ley de nosotros dice, antes que el Estado implemente una iniciativa, el pueblo cuna, en su asamblea, que es el Congreso General Cuna, tiene que aprobarlo. Otra de las iniciativas vino la explotación minera, la exploración minera. De igual manera fue rechazado, de manera rotunda. ¿ya? Igual, el último intento fue red de mercado voluntario. O sea, estamos asediados por la presión del Estado un momento dado de hacer cambiar nuestra regla de juego o nuestras normas eh, tradicionales, normas internas de, de gestionar los recursos naturales. Pero eso no quiere decir que, que el pueblo cuna no quiera aportar el Estado. Eso es esa riqueza de, de biodiversidad que existe en nuestro pueblo, en nuestro territorio, apoya al pueblo, enriquece al pueblo panameño. Porque si nosotros destruyéramos todo ese, ese territorio, esos bosques que tenemos, vamos a perder muchas especies endémicas que hay en nuestra región. ¿ya? Ahora todavía en Panamá, a nivel internacional, un ejemplo, se habla del de peligro de extensión del tapir. Y en nuestro territorio todavía hay tapires que todavía lo vemos. ¿ya? O sea, son especies que todavía lo mantenemos. Imagínense si nosotros entramos en el juego de economizar el, eh, los recursos naturales o la biodiversidad, vamos a ir destruyendo y vamos a empeorar la situación de la biodiversidad que está en peligro de extensión. Entonces ese aporte muchas veces los estados no lo contabilizan o no lo reconocen. Thank you, porque están al frente, ¿ya? Así que este es un contexto general de la, cómo manejamos el tema de los recursos naturales y la biodiversidad. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Thank you, Onel. Um, I think, um, Onel, you brought some very good points um, that have come to fruition, the, the importance of governance um, by indigenous or local communities and um, that our relationship, um, we are not owners of nature, nature is owners of us. Um, Laura also brought to the table um, the important and intrinsic relationship we have between people and nature. I think uh, Laura also highlighted um, while communities are executing according to their practice and they're finding their solutions, there's still an um, inequity in resources um, that permit communities to manage those resources effectively and confront the challenges that are coming to them. Um, you know, we also talked about the need um, and the impacts of and, and the issues that communities are having regarding um, what is happening to the environment and the need to respond to those issues um, and how um, when incentives are developed they should be developed in conjunction with the communities to meet the community's needs. So just a little bit of synopsis of this conversation but 
I'm looking, we have a, a plethora of questions. Um, so I wanted to give the opportunity for everyone to ask questions because I think all of our speakers have raised um, a, a number of issues that we could probably spend another two, three or four days speaking about. Um, so let's open it up. Um, there's a lot of chatter on, on that. So I wanna open it up to the questions and, and Tony, you're gonna, you're gonna take advantage of asking some of the questions that have popped up in the chat as well. Okay, thank you, Kristen. I'll, I'll try to do that. Um, but I, I undoubtedly we won't get through all of the questions. Uh, uh, but we will, uh, we will distribute uh, the set of questions to the to the, the panel members and, uh, uh, you know, much appreciated. So let me just start with one that um, and, and I'm going to generally follow uh, the order they came in except uh, to try to cover our different uh, panel speakers as well. Uh, but here's one I'm going to pose uh, to to uh, all three of the speakers, uh, Fikret, Laura, and Onel. Uh, you, uh, this is from Chantel. Uh, you briefly noted the important role of, this was to me originally, you briefly noted the important role of government support uh, for community-based conservation or co-management, and that government support can vary. What are the most effective approaches you and, and the other panelists uh, have found to engage reluctant government agencies? So at the community level, what have been some strategies that, uh, that you found successful? And uh, maybe um, I could start in order uh, with uh, Fikrit if, if you uh, have some thoughts on that. Uh, yes, uh, hi, hi, uh, hello again, everyone. Strategies. Well, it, it, it really depends on, on the, uh, the area, the people involved, the government involved. Some governments have experienced working with indigenous communities and rural communities. Others are, are just beginners. Others uh, seem to refuse to be engaged. So, so there's, a, there's a huge variation in the kinds of things that can be done. In many of the cases, the best thing the government can do, unfortunately, is simply not to get in the way of the, the community to do their own conservation. In other words, give political space for people to operate. Uh, if the cooperation gets serious, if it's a co-management kind of situation, and we have many co-managed protected areas, for example, indigenous protected areas in Australia are all co-managed. In that case, you need a written agreement that spells out the rights and, uh, and powers of, of the various parties. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there, but those, those are the two important strategies. One, to give political space and two, to do proper co-management where you, where you actually recognize the rights and, and, and allow people to, to do what they do best. Thank you, Fikret. Uh, Laura, in your uh, region, what about community strategies there? Well, I think um, responding to um, what Fikret mentioned in his previous uh, comments about triggers, um, in my experience, communities have a, a better strategic advantage in times of crisis. And these trigger points actually create new conditions where often governments are more motivated to work together with communities um, to actually overcome the crisis. Sometimes it's a political crisis, sometimes it's an environmental crisis. Um, in, in the case in Clockwood Sound, it was, it was a, a financial crisis and political crisis um, scaling global um, worldwide, and that really motivated um, government to, to sit at the table with community. But in Nova Scotia, and, and Tony knows this well, in, in the wake of the collapse of the Northern Cod fishery, government was unusually open to looking at innovation for a brief point in time, uh, because so many communities were in economic crisis. And um, so that window of opportunity is critical and it's important that um, communities know how to catalyze a window of opportunity or seize a window of opportunity when conditions are right. Thank you. Uh, Odell, uh, buenos dias, uh, tiene una respuesta? Sí, este, en primer lugar, yo creo que hay una limitante en sentido de que La experiencia nos indica 
no hay una política del Estado. So, hay políticas de gobierno. Eso significa que en muchos casos hay gobiernos que quieren trabajar de manera coordinada, mejorar las relaciones con los pueblos indígenas. Pero cuando viene otro gobierno, deshace ese, ese, ese paso, ese de, eh, avance que hizo. Entonces, esto es la dificultad más grande, que porque eso dificulta, porque cada gobierno, como le digo, que trae su librito de relacionar con los pueblos indígenas y, la, y su interés que trae, ¿no? Entonces, yo creo que lo que nosotros hemos incidido acá, la, la experiencia es, como tenemos nuestro autogobierno, los gobiernos necesariamente tienen que sentar con nosotros cuando quiere implementar una iniciativa. Nosotros estamos anuentes como pueblos indígenas, de sentar con el gobierno, de apoyar el proceso del tema ambiental. ¿Ya? Así que yo creo que esto, ahí por lo menos actualmente hay avance, para decirte sincero, que hay iniciativas que estamos, ahora mismo estamos desarrollando una iniciativa en la comunidad, donde tenemos un respaldo político. Porque el asunto es que el, los gobiernos nunca tienen presupuesto para iniciativas indígenas, ¿ya?, el indígena tiene que buscar recursos a nivel internacional, a nivel de instituciones de apoyo solidaria para realizar sus propias en sus comunidades. Este es el asunto. Pero políticamente muchas veces nos sentamos y decimos, sí, te podemos ayudar, te podemos facilitar esto, pero no hay una cuestión, una, una, visión, eh, una voluntad política integral de apoyar toda la iniciativa de los pueblos sin viene de trabajar. Yo creo que esta es la dificultad que hay, ¿ya? Porque si realmente un gobierno quiere trabajar con los pueblos indígenas, tiene que ser de manera integral, no de una manera parcial y no de una manera eh, de cada gobierno, sino tiene que ser una política de Estado, de relación pueblos indígenas y ya. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Gracias, Onel. Uh, if I can uh, move to, uh, to another uh, question and... Uh, perhaps I should be posing to individuals, but I'm, this one I'm going to actually pose again to all three of you. Um, this is from uh, Sian uh, Bochma. Do you see possible connections of different knowledge systems, worldviews like indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge in empowering these com communities and tackling challenges like biodiversity? Connections among different knowledge systems. I, I think all three of you had said, have said something on this, but I just want to pose that uh, from CN. Uh, could I start with uh, Onel this time, if, you, uh, if you've heard that, Onel? Oh. ¿Me, me puede repetir la pregunta que no... A veces la señal ah, se va. Yes. ¿Me puede yes. repetir la pregunta? Repeat the question, please. Yes. Um, do you see uh, connections between different knowledge systems and worldviews that can help to empower communities and tackle challenges like biodiversity? Different connections of knowledge systems and worldviews. Sí, yo creo que sí. Yo soy un fiel creyente como pueblos indígenas y como que he dado parte de mi vida a, a dar seguimiento al tema de ese conocimiento indígena, yo creo que sí. Yo creo que los dos sistemas de conocimiento, el occidental y el indígena, son complementarias. Se debe trabajar en conjunto. Yo por eso que nosotros, un grupo de pueblos indígenas a nivel global, estamos trabajando dentro del IPES, ¿ya? de impulsar este, ese posicionamiento. ¿ya? que se valorice realmente los aportes que dan los conocimientos en materia de la conservación de la biodiversidad. Entonces, yo, me, para mí es factible trabajar en los dos sistemas. Si los dos sistemas respetan su límite de acción ¿ya? y valorizan entre sí los dos sistemas. Yo creo que como pueblos indígenas sí valorizamos el, los conocimientos científicos occidentales. Lo hacemos porque nosotros usamos mucha herramienta para hacer nuestro trabajo en el campo. Así que yo creo que sí es posible y tenemos que impulsar ese, esa visión de complementaridad, porque nadie es, tiene la verdad absoluta. Entonces tiene que ser para si realmente queremos pensar en, en gestionar de manera 
adecuado la biodiversidad y los recursos naturales, los dos sistemas de conocimiento tienen que ir juntos. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, can I turn to Laura in your uh, region of Canada? Uh, what about uh, the links of knowledge systems and worldviews? I think we're living proof that integrating knowledge systems are really important and, and really respecting diverse worldviews are essential for catalyzing change. Um, I think on I think I heard Onel saying there is complementarity between indigenous knowledge systems and science knowledge systems. That said, um, it is not to be taken lightly um, what it means to actually experience uh, an Indigenous worldview of this place. And I was really humbled uh, recently in trying to organize a, a knowledge symposium, which was intended to integrate knowledge systems and be very inclusive. And um, our New Chalneth uh, advisors said, no, you need to listen and learn how to even take care of knowledge. You need to really learn about um, what uh, the Nichalneth knowledge system entails. It, it entails cycles, it entails completely different um, reference points of learning and, and, uh, and that I think slowed me down and um, they have been teaching us uh, and there is much to learn. So I, I absolutely agree and it's not to be taken lightly what that means in practice. Thank you. And uh, Fikrit, a comment from you? Uh, yes, uh, yes. Words of wisdom from our panelists. Uh, definitely agree. Um, the, uh, it's been only about 20, possibly 25, 30 years that indigenous knowledge and world views are, are really taken seriously by, by the science and governments. But it's, it's a revolution. It's an ongoing revolution. And, those of you who follow IPBS know that, that this is one international organization dealing with biodiversity conservation that actually does take indigenous knowledge seriously. The, uh, the contribution I wanna to make to this discussion though is that we have to be really careful about integrating, quote unquote integrating, because the experience is that quite often integrating means um, mining, local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, uh, basically colonizing knowledge. So we, we have to, uh, we have to, we, we have to know about indigenous knowledge. We have to um, respect it and use it, but, but, but without colonizing it. Uh, this goes back to eminent scientists, uh, mining Amazonian knowledge of uh, medicinal plants, for example. That, that the time in the 50s and the 60s was mostly perfectly normal. Now it's not. There are a lot of safeguards now. You, you, you can't just walk into the free territory in Canada or the, or the territory in Panama and say, okay, tell me all you know. It, it, it doesn't work anymore. People have to control their numbers. Mm -hmm. That's also part okay. of the Thanks. Well, thank you. And uh, I, I would love to keep going with. Uh, 33 more questions uh, for uh, quite a bit longer, but we really uh, have to respect uh, the time and we're coming up on the hour. Um, and and as, um, as the wonderful co-chair of CIS, uh, Amayeli Ramos has noted in the chat, we will be um, putting a recording of this and, uh, and the questions that were posed and other material uh, on website so uh, people can have a look at it. Um, I'm going to turn it back to you, Kristen, for our uh, our closing. Sure. Thank you. Great. Um, we want to thank all of our panelists for their participation today. And, and I think as, as obvious, um, I know that we've had a lot of virtual sessions. This one, I think, was obviously too short for today. Um, but I do want to recognize all of the participation that we have had from around the world, um, Nigeria, Colombia, Canada, uh, um, the US, uh, South America. Um, and I think it really begs to different, that we need to continue to elevate uh, the work of communities in the context of conservation 
We need to support um, institutional strengthening of local communities, but also indigenous governance and their and, and governance systems. Um, the issues around how we change the rules so that communities and indigenous peoples can achieve those solutions, working with governance is gonna be continuously important in this post COVID period. Um, and then the need for investment. We need to really help and drive governments and philanthropy to invest in indigenous peoples and local community solutions if we are gonna save the planet. So we thank you on behalf of the IUCN Commission on Environment, Economics and Social Policy, and also on the Community Conservation Resource Network as well. Um, and thank you for your participation today and thank you to all of our panelists. Have a great day Thanks, everyone. following the CC dialogue series. We'll have several more in the future. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey. Gracias. Gracias.